set of journal reflections were due by midterm. Okay, so if you didn't have those in, you got a bad midterm grade, which was embarrassing and you couldn't talk to your parents for weeks and all of that jazz. But um, what we want to see, what we were wanting to see with the journal reflections was an entry about every one or two weeks throughout the entire semester because that's what journal reflections are supposed to do. It's not supposed to be like an all-nighter at the end of the semester. Oh, I've got 15 journal reflections that I've got to put in. So we're in the second. Um, we're in the second phase of that, right? So there were two journal assignment things that are on Blackboard. The first one was for the first half of the semester. The second one's for the second half of the semester, right? Right? And TJ, what did I do for you in regarding journal reflections? Uh, five points off. Right, so you got your, your square, right? Yeah, I should have all my things. All right. What? For the five points yeah. off? Yeah. yeah. So what that means is I opened up the first half journal reflection A, and if you didn't have at least four journal reflections in that uh, file, you could have caught up and everybody got that email. If you had four or five, then you didn't have to worry about it, right? So now we're in the second half of the semester, which is journal B. And I will start grading those the Friday of finals, which is in Friday, a week from Friday, right? And you want to have five, if you want to really have a great, easy, no problem A, you want to have at least five journal entries, four gets you a passing grade, right? Five gets you into the A range, right? Five that actually are more than one or two sentences gets you in a comfortable A range, right? That's all due by next Friday. That's, the journals are due by next Friday. Okay. Yeah. Define one or two. One or two sentences? Yeah. Well, as <laughs> presuming that your sentences are not run ons, like, and you're not German, because then they, a sentence can go on for pages if it's German. <laughs> right. Are they supposed to be like 300 words? 300 words makes for what? About a page and a half. No? The standard for the journalistic standard for a page of double space, 12 to 14, 12 point Arial or Times Roman font is 250 words per page. In terms of the scoring on your journal. Yeah, on that On that portion of it, right? So you have five of those. Now, there are a couple of things. If you submit all five the last day of the, of the semester, that gets discounted. But, okay? Didn't you want to all in one document? What? Didn't you want to all in one document? No. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, you've been doing that. <laughs> but. I thought we came onto the same page. So if you go to, let me show you. This should be old hat for everybody. But if you go to assignments, and now we're in journal B, right? And you go to create journal entry, it will allow you to create a unique journal entry. So what I like to see is five of those unique journal entries created, right? 
And then I look at them and go, wow, what an amazing student. I'm so glad they're graduating. No, I'm so, because, you know, I want you to go out and do well in the world. I, would you rather have me say, Marty, what an amazing student. I think I want to keep them around for another year. I mean, regardless, I'm leaving. So. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Huh? Actually, I'm leaving, too. I don't know if everybody knows, but this is my last semester you at Michigan. I will be teaching at Central Michigan University in the fall uh, in Mount Pleasant. So you can come up and you can take entrepreneurship from me again, or you can take human resources management. Very exciting. So, and I have all summer to get ready for that, so that'll be fun. Okay, so that's what you want to do for that. Now, since we're on Blackboard, we go back to the assignments. And you'll see that this personal code of ethics, everybody should have that in now, right? That was due mm, three weeks ago, probably. And then I sent a nasty gram to a number of folks that didn't have it in. I did, and said, hey, get it in. And uh, so that's important because it lays the groundwork for the second paper. And the second paper is due when? Tuesday. Final. Next Tuesday. Yes. No, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, because I want to actually grade them. Do I, you really? Yes, I yes. do. <laughs> actually, I'm going to ask Professor King to grade them all. <laughs> he doesn't know that. Uh, and we're going to talk about that assignment tonight. As a matter of fact, that's what, that's what we're supposed to be talking about tonight. So you have a week to get ready for that. Right? And yes? Uh, the code crisis thing is next Tuesday, so we don't have a final? So there is an assignment called a final reflection. Okay. So there's okay. nothing that makes you show up the week and turn that in. What now? You just turn that in? No. You're going to show up next Tuesday, and we're going to talk about your papers in class. And hopefully, Professor King will be here, and he will give you some wise words of wisdom to set, send you on your way, right? And I'll be here, and it'll be my last class ever at Benedictine, except for finals. Huh? I am bringing a bottle of peach wine from Texas that somebody in the room gave me who doesn't drink anymore. So, well, everybody can have just a little bit of that because there's only one bottle. Can we bring quantities of our own? Well, I, pardon? Can we BYOB? I am not going to say anything else about that. Can we just have a reflection of the Wait, so do we have to come for the final exam time? No. Your next week is it in terms of required. Now, I can tell you the final reflection is basically what did you learn? What did you think about the class? And I will let you know that this is actually a very important opportunity to give feedback to Professor King and all the folks that will be here next year because I won't be here to make sure that this class is operating in any kind of effective way. The question was the last thing, grading for you ever, is that what's considered the final so it's turned in on final day? I would prefer, look, Alejandro, that is not a big deal. You're going to drink three beers, and then you're going to sit down and write that. <laughs> That's your assignment. <laughs> because I want you to be honest. I want all the filters that say, oh, no, I better not say that, to go away and be honest. <laughs> no, no, not really, not really. Not really. I, don't, I don't want that, truly. But what, I've, what we really want from that is 
some information so as they're contemplating how to do this class again next year, they can make it better. I was just asking a general question for somebody else who wanted to speak. Right. Oh, I think it's due the Friday night of finals with everything else. If you look at the syllabus, everything else is due that Friday. Kelly, are we on the same page? Yes. Journal and final reflection. Everything that you haven't turned in that you're worried about, get it in Friday night of finals week so that we can grade them without pulling our hair out. Right? <laughs> what? Yeah. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Where, where's your job at? In uh, Mount Pleasant, Michigan. So you in school? Yeah, Central Michigan University. Oh, nice. I'll be cleaning the bathrooms. <laughs> it's gonna be, yeah. Actually, they, they're going to let me teach, which is an amazing thing. Is he just like Gabriel Hunting? Yes. So the other way around. The other way around, that's right. I used to be a teacher. You know. You'll find me under a bridge someplace in central Michigan, kind of hanging out. I used to teach. Okay, so now let's, if you look, so you have these, Journal A, Journal B, Professional Code, Professional Practice Code and, practice, and Crisis Plan. And then... Tell you what, um, the final reflection. See if I have it set up as a discussion. Yeah. This is the last time we show up for class before the final, which we show up for which the final reflection is due. No. No. Okay. When is this? Okay. So the final, this is an evening class, right? So the final would have been when? Do you really want to come Thursday at 5 30? Yes. I No, we're not. Don't show up Thursday at 5 30. Okay. Show up Tuesday. Next Tuesday night, which is on the schedule. That's when the May 3rd paper is due. Yeah. And then reflection and all the rest of the journals are That's actually May 3rd. And there's not actual reflection paper in Christ. The reflection is the final. No, the reflection is something that you will find online. It's not there yet. You will find online soon. All right. Or, or actually, see, here's the thing. If, some, if somebody doesn't show up the last class, tell you what I'm going to do. I will bring paper copies of the final reflection to class next Tuesday, right? And it'll be due that Friday. And it'll be due at the end of class on Tuesday if you're sh slick about it, right? And if you're not, you can email it to me. Does that make sense? What? You, what is your major? You're an accountant, aren't you? Yeah. 
your planner should have been defined by the schedule in the syllabus. And the schedule in the syllabus doesn't say we're supposed to be here for a final. Right? Right? The final reflection is something that we'll do online or if you want. We'll just do it online. It's easier online. We'll just do it online and it'll be due that Friday. Okay? That'll be easy. Right. Does that make sense, guys? Is everybody happy about that? Okay. Now, the only way that you can flunk the final reflection is not to turn it in. Okay? Does that make sense? And you're going to have to, if, you know, it's really hard to get a C on the final reflection. You have to turn it in. You have to say something. Right. But we're very lenient on that. All right? So now, what is this final paper supposed to be? Your ethical crisis plan and your professional code of ethics. Does that make sense? That, so here is the framework that I want you, to, want you to be on board for. Your personal code of ethics is the standards that you set for yourself in all roles of your life, right? Your professional codes of ethic, code of ethics deals specifically with the intended profession you are going into. So you have to deal with accounting, okay? And you have to say, as an accountant, these are the standards that I am going to hold myself um, accountable to, responsible for. These are the standards that I'm going to accept. Like if you're a Boy Scout, you have the Boy Scout code, right? If you're an accountant, you have everything that the professional AIC, AICPA standards suggest, but what I'm asking you to do is to take that and tailor it specifically to the career that you're envisioning for yourself. So for accountants, it's fairly easy because the standards are so clear cut. For people that are going to be an officer in the military or in the police academy, those are typically fairly well laid out standards. For people that are going into general management, eh, it can be a little more difficult because there are lots of different permutations of codes for that have been proposed for professional managers, but there's not one singular one that everybody says that's the code for management, right? Does that make sense? And we'll look at these. I mean, you know, teachers have them, um, journalists have them. Um, Accountants have them, marketers have them, advertisers have them, uh, computer scientists have them. Every pretty much any group that offers a certification or is a professional membership association will have a code of conduct, a set of professional standards. I belong to, or off and on again. I just joined the Society for Human Resources Management and uh, the Academy of Management, which is a professional association of business professors. And we have a long, drawn out professional code of conduct as well. Right, does that make sense? So um, finance and bankers have them too. You know, um, they don't always follow them, but they have them, they have them. So that's interesting. So you start there and you say, all right, I draw on and I'm informed by three sources for my professional code of conduct that I'm creating. One is your personal standards, right? So I want you to think specifically about how or where your personal standards might come into conflict with 
the professional code of conduct that your industry area has created. For example, if you become a lawyer, you have a professional code which commits you to being a strong advocate for your clients. And sometimes lawyers have problems with that when their client has done something that they know is unacceptable morally. You know, that creates some tension. So you have to figure out where those hot points are and what you're going to do about it, right? In this environment, what are some classic issues there? You know, if you're a pharmacist or if you're in medicine, if you're a nurse or a doctor and somebody comes and asks for certain kinds of procedures or for certain kinds of advice, sometimes that is difficult because it conflicts with some of our uh, Catholic moral principles. Does that make sense? And we deal with that on an everyday basis in, in the professions. Is that, you know? But, you know, if you're in advertising and your boss brings in a client, you know, for any of a, an array of different businesses that are morally problematic, what do you do? That's a good question. You know? That's a, a very good question to have. So that's what I want you to kind of think through uh, in this statement. So that's really the first part. And that first part basically asks you to create the statement, but also it asks for you to kind of review what the pre-existing codes of conduct are in your profession, what they say. Does that make sense? You say, well, if you're in uh, public accounting, the uh, AICPA, right, is the go-to set of standards. But what if you're going to be in managerial accounting? Or you want to be a controller? Well, it turns out there are other sets of standards that those groups have adopted. So it wouldn't be the AICPA code of conduct if you're anticipating being uh, a corporate controller or you're going into other branches of accounting. Does that make sense? Um, then the second part is your ethical crisis plan. And we've already talked about ethical crisis plans um, in class previously. But it's your own personalized uh, plan for how you're going to deal with ethical dilemmas or ethical crises. <coughs> Not what the results of, of any particular situation are, but how you're going to approach a situation where you're feeling like you have a very difficult decision to make and it involves moral principles and choices. Okay? Are you going to call your dad? Are you going to go talk to your, um, you know, call up Deacon Dana? Say, hey, what do I do? Right? Um, and that's actually one of the suggested options in ethical crisis plans. Identify somebody that you think really has a good moral handle and a good head on their shoulders and call them for <coughs> advice. Now you have to be somewhat careful about confidentiality and things that you're supposed to be sharing and not supposed to be sharing. But that's a great strategy. That's a great strategy. So over at the Mount and at the Abbey, we call that process a discernment process to figure out what the right thing to do is. But then also you've got to think about how you're going to actually implement what you know is right. How you're going to actually set the stage so that you have the greatest chance of affecting the positive outcomes that you want to see. So 
that's really what we've been working at and for all semester. So you've come out of here having thought about those things. And actually, you know, you've been through a rehearsal with one, once or twice in your head. Okay. You kind of know where the shallow water is and you know what to do and you've practiced a little bit in your head what to do when you get into what you see as a dangerous situation. Make sense? Right. Different professional arenas have different ethical challenges. And so part of this process is going like, okay, if I'm in, if I'm in banking, one of the big things that I have to worry about is conflicts of interest. Situations where my professional um, decisions may be clouded or they may appear to be clouded by the fact that what I'm doing can have a positive personal benefit. And that's a huge issue in all, uh, all of the financial services, right? And in fact, in some financial services arenas, they actually intentionally create that issue. Hey, if you sell this particular stock to your clients, we'll give you a bonus, right? That creates ethical problems, interestingly enough. And sometimes the environments that exist within those professional companies don't want you to be thinking about those ethical dilemmas. But because you graduated from Benedictine, Amy, you will think about them. Okay. And you go, darn it, not really a problem. No, you won't. You know, you'll think about them. Okay. So that should be, I think you can get this done probably in four or five pages if you're really focused, right? Uh, I wouldn't write more than seven or eight pages because if you're writing more than seven or eight pages, chances are you're losing focus. You could be more to the point, concise. Yeah. One assignment, part A and part B all together. Yes. So that assignment is going to have two major sections, or three if you want. Let's make it three. The first one is what are the pre-existing professional codes that exist that, that are out there, right? And then what's my translation? What's my professional code? And then how do I set the stage for implementing that code in my actual career, which is your ethical crisis plan. Okay? Make sense? All right. Okay, so what do I have for you? I have some PowerPoint slides. And I have some I think we have to see what this, this thing.
this is making a little bit of fun, but it's in, it, serious, about prof uh, the, the journalistic code that people in that profession um, subscribe to. And focusing on what? Things like don't plagiarize. In journalism, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, write the truth. Don't make up stories and pretend like they're true. And a lot of scandals over the last 10 years in journalism focus on violations of either of one of those two principles, right? What's interesting about the journalistic code of ethics, the accounting code, the marketing code, is how generalized they all are in focusing on values and principles as the drivers of the professional code. So in common across all of these different codes of ethics, you're usually going to find some discussion of the role of that professional area or activity in promoting the common good and by implication in a lot of, uh, in a lot of codes, the dignity or the health, welfare, and well-being of individuals, which I think is great, right? Most of them also talk about integrity. Uh, in business codes, you're going to see a strong emphasis on uh, staying up to date and diligence, right? Just like in accounting, you wouldn't want your accountant to be an expert in the 2014 tax code if it's 2017, right? Well, I haven't looked at it in, in three years, but I really know the one from three years ago that's not going to fly. Does that make sense? So we'll see those themes, and we'll talk a little bit about those themes next week to a certain extent. So, in journalism as well, there's a, a big controversy about whether bloggers should have a, a code of ethics. Um, this is for the Certified Financial Association of America. Conduct, May 2nd, 2012, Volume 1, Study Session 1, Reading 1. Ethics. And I'm not going to show you this because it goes on for quite a while and it's really boring because it's all automated. But um, one of the things that people in finance in, uh, in that area um, of business should know is the CFA has great resources on uh, standards and codes of conduct in banking and financial services. So it's, um, if you're interested, I can send you out the, um, the link so you can come by the office and I'll show you where they, where they are. So uh, similar things exist in marketing and in accounting. A great example of codes that make a difference. The real core code of ethics is one of the most important reasons for a prospective client to choose to work with you over a non Is it real order. estate and in insurance? Your promise to your client Both of these areas of professional practice in the real estate require that every certified professional have know, updated training, updated training enforcement process for every two years. years in to ethics. live by the code, you must understand the code. Training in the Code of Ethics is mandatory to maintain your membership and retain the right to call yourself a realtor. And the National Association of in Realtors real estate, has put together like a video series that is, is perfect is for self-study or to be played at office meetings. Each video is five or six minutes long, Turn and you down. can download documents what? as study oh, guides, great. including talking points and follow-up questions to stimulate group discussion. So take a few minutes to fully understand the Realtor Code of Ethics. Live by the code and be sure to tell your clients about it. Is that better? It is an important difference Grace? between working with a realtor and just better? a licensee. Links to the videos and support materials are listed in your email and in the description below. You will need your realtor credentials to access the website because only realtors abide by the code. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I think we have 
Thanks for watching, and thank you for being a member of the Washington Association of Realtors. Only realtors are real. Okay, got it. So let's go through a couple things just real quick. We've already talked about the four elements uh, that um, feed into an ethical decision in class. Um, we've talked about duties and obligations in class. We've talked about fiduciary duties, I think. And again, just laying the framework for this last paper, the sources that you can use in understanding what your ethical kind of frameworks might be include your personal code. Personal code reflects your formation. Your formation is anchored in your experiences with your family, in theological sources, in the law, legal sources, and in philosophical traditions. All four feed into your understanding of morality on a daily basis, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, then we have professional and industry norms and codes, and then we have company codes. So company codes are a bit different because company codes come in a number of different flavors. The ethical credo, usually a one or two page statement that lays kind of the uh, values framework for a company is the closest that we get to kind of normative standards like I'm asking you to think about in, in this paper. Um, codes of conduct in, eth in business environments typically go beyond that and identify sensitive or hot point issues in that uh, company's professional kind of ecosystem and or regulatory frameworks that they have to make sure everybody's sensitive to. And things that they didn't want you to do because they want to make as much money as possible and all that stuff. Right? So. We have these four sources. When you get to your ethical crisis plan, we also have to recognize that that's where you blend your professional code with these other things that go on in your life, like your personal code, your duty to family, your duty to your community. How are you going to balance all of that out? And let me ask you, of these kind of different frameworks, which do you think is the most important? Company code, professional code, personal code. Which do you think is the most important? Personal. I would vote heavily for a pers your personal code of ethics as being the most, the most important because integrity in your life is driven by and anchored in your personal code of ethics, right? Your personal code is an expression of what you live with and what you want to be known for, what your legacy is supposed to be, or what you want it to be. In some cases, that might mean that you consciously say, I'm not going to do it with the professional code of ethics in my particular area of practice suggests. In some cases, that might mean that you will do things that are contrary to your company code. And the key here is to understand the ramifications of taking that kind of stand and be okay with it. 
you know. Because that's where the virtue of courage really gets staked into the ground. Right. So we've got these anchor points. And there are some things that can go into your ethical crisis plan that I want you to consider. One is what we call quick tests. Kind of rules of thumb that help you understand whether you're on the right track or not on the right track for um, a contemplated course of action. The easiest one to understand is the light of day test. Right? And that comes in all kinds of different permutations and flavors. What if what I was, I'm thinking about doing was on the front page of my local paper tomorrow? Would, be I, would I be okay with it, right? What if my mother or my father got a call and said, did you know what Marty was up to? Right? Are you going to be okay with it? What if my kids found out? Are you going to be okay with that? 20 years in the future, you know? Because everybody in here, most of you guys who think, like, might have kids, think about now what would happen if they found out 10 or 15 years from now what you were up to tomorrow night <laughs> or tonight. And if you're okay with that, then it's probably not too reprehensible morally. Does that make sense? So the light of day test really reflects whether what you're about to do is consistent with your uh, interpretation of societal normative values. Right? And on this campus, you could also ask, what if the people over at the Abbey found out? Right? Or over at the Mount? Does that make sense? What if my priest knew? Would I be okay with that? Would I not be embarrassed by it? So those are quick steps or checks. Another quick step is asking a mentor, somebody that you know and trust, right? And those are the two big ones that I can that I can identify with. Then a discernment framework is a set of steps that you engage and go through when you're faced with an ethical crisis. And discernment procedures do two things. One, they help you get a complete handle on the situation to the best of your ability. A lot of times, unethical behavior or behavior that people later regret is predicated on people acting hastily without full information about what the, the outcome of their, the effects of their behavior might be, right? So do you have all the facts? Do you understand where everybody that's involved in the situation is coming from? All of those questions can go into a discernment process to help make sure that you understand the situation that you're in. Second thing that a discernment process uh, should help you do is to fully think about all of the alternatives that are possible in that particular situation. So, has anybody ever has anybody ever seen The Firm? So it's a movie. It's with one of the Toms. It's not Tom Hanks. It's with Tom. Is, is that the one with like the no. third party? Is it Tom Cruise? Tom Cruise. Yeah, he's a young lawyer, and he gets hired by a firm that ends up being the representative firm for the mafia, right? And anybody that leaves the firm ends up dead. Remember that? 
and he's married to a great gal. But anyway. Huh? Yeah. But Tom Hank, I mean Tom Cruise in that in that film is trapped because he can't turn these guys in because he's a lawyer and he's got he'll be debarred if he you know if he shares the secrets of the firm. He can't walk away from it because they have embarrassing footage of him uh, down in Jamaica or someplace with somebody that they used to set him up so they would get embarrassing footage. And, and, and he doesn't want to get killed. And so on. So he has all these moral dilemmas. And he figures a creative way out at the end of the film. I'm not going to tell you what that is. But he creates a strategy that allows him to maintain his moral integrity as well as professional code of standards and conduct that creates a win-win solution. Now, it, that particular course of action was not obvious. It's something that took some creative reflection. So a good discernment process kind of helps you think creatively about how we can possibly engage in a course of action, not a singular behavior, but a course of action. It might take a series of steps that were, will result in a moral outcome. And I want to emphasize truly that the best ethical thinking focuses on a series of actions rather than uh, what we oftentimes think is the only option. You know, I have to do this or this. So you look at a series of actions that will get you to where you're going, right? And then the third thing that a good crisis plan will do, a discernment process, will put into place a reflective component that allows you to fully understand all of the implications of each of those possible courses of action. You still have to decide at the end of the day which action to actually take. But at the end of the discernment process, you know fully, if I do this, here are likely all of the consequences, unintended or intended, the pros and cons, from a moral standpoint. From a moral standpoint, which is different from a utilitarian, who's going to win, who's going to lose, right? A moral standpoint. What rights and duties apply in this situation? How are the goods and bads spread out across all of the stakeholders? And so on and so forth. So if you can develop that plan and implement it, when you're faced with moral choices, I think you'll be a lot better off moving forward, right? Because I'll tell you, the one thing that sticks with you and ends up being incredibly debilitating, people tell me, uh, if you don't make the right choice, is guilt. Not doing the right thing has one guaranteed consequence, and that's guilt and the stain that it leaves on your own self-concept, your own, your own understanding of who you are. What if, uh, I mean, I'm sure that people who don't do guilty about what they do. Yes. Well, you know, the psychologists, the folks that focus on behavioral ethics, actually consider that to be a real important issue. And that's, um, if you listen to Dan Arley, he's really in favor of confession. Okay? Because what he says is that confession gives Catholics, for the most part, an opportunity to reset. Who, who, who said this? Dan Arley. Dan Early is a social psychologist, behavioral econo economist at Duke right now. So, but 
but like not necessarily confession like the sacrament per se, but just like being able to go in front of someone and say. Well, he's Jewish, so he yeah. was so talking about confession, maybe not understanding it as deeply as you you do, yeah. right? But the idea that we can, if we're down in a dark place, right, and we've given up hope and we identify as a bad person, how do you get on the right path, right? Ask for mercy. Huh? Ask for mercy. Ask for mercy, right. And, you know, that's one of the interesting components of 12-step programs out of addiction is there's a set of steps that allow people that are in that dark place that need to get out of addiction or whatever to reset their lives, which I think is fascinating. But it's, it's really important to the whole process, right? So you have to be able to identify, I, that old person I'm not proud of, but I'm not that person anymore. Does that make sense? Anyway. So, I don't want to bore you guys um, all night. Um, these slides will uh, are available on Blackboard. And here's a couple of examples of ethical crises, strategies. What's interesting is they all kind of have those three, those three or four basic components that I just talked about. This first one's fairly simple. Gather facts, then use the ethical traditions from philosophy as frameworks for evaluating the pros and cons of any particular alternative. And then if, once you've gone through that analysis, this framework says that they're going to look at these overriding factors. Now, does anybody know what the double effect test is? What a double effect is from uh, philosophy? Hmm? Double effects are simply unintended consequences. Okay? So we want to try to anticipate unintended consequences of our actions. Does that make sense? And if the unintended or the unwanted consequences are acceptable in the circumstances, then that's where you want to be. Here's another one, very similar. This one adds a <clears throat> component that says, okay, I'm going to take the person that is the most disadvantaged by a particular course of action, and I'm going to try and walk in their shoes for a little while and see how that fits. I wish sometimes they would do that more in our state houses and in Washington. Right? We're anticipating implementing this bill. How is it going to affect the people, the people that it affects most negatively? Are we okay with that effect? Right? So it's, it's an interesting way of looking at things. And then the one that I've been teaching um, for the last couple of years. What are the facts? What are the ethical issues? What are your ethical and virtuous aspirations? Courses of alternative action, and then an analysis of each course of action, and then comparing the results of that analysis, that moral evaluation of each course of action, with your personal code of ethics and what your aspirations were in the situation. Then you take the least reprehensible or the best choice. Sometimes there are no great choices. Sometimes you have to accept, well, you know, it's bad, 
but it's not as bad as the alternative. Would you lie to save a human life? I think the church says yes. That's morally okay. Uh, it does. Aquinas says no. Oh. That, that's a really big debate. Okay. <laughs> Aquinas says no. Aquinas, Aquinas says um, to lie is intrinsically evil, like uh -huh. evil, evil in itself. But he also says you don't have to be completely honest in situations where life is at stake. Exactly. Exactly. You okay. get different responses from different theology teachers here. Okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. You guys are well trained. Good. Keep it up. All right. But I would lie to save a human life, probably, you know. It depends on the seriousness of the lie, I guess. It also depends on who it is. Yeah, yeah. Because to me, losing a life is more serious than the intrinsically evil lie. Okay. What I was alluding to is even the church recognizes that in some situations, you have to trade off. There's what we call prudential judgment that has to be applied. All right, so that's my crisis plan. And the bell says, after I take roll, we're done. Are there any questions? Does that make sense? All right, so let's see who's here so that we can hold the people who are not here accountable. Darn those people. Darn those people.